بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم نحمده ونصلي على رسوله الكريم. So inshallah today um, we'll go over the topic that we discussed on the group. So I'll put it down as uh, how do we balance uh, practicing Islam, um, going about our uh, daily kind of work life, um, our family life, um, and I guess maybe rather than saying Islam, I should maybe say like you know balancing our worship of Allah because maybe that's what will be most people kind of perceive was it called um, religion. Um, so anyway, so the first thing is that I've mentioned it a few times before is that obviously the the important thing is to have our uh, priorities in order. So everything that we do has to have the kind of same overarching uh, purpose, which is that we as Muslims, we accept that Islam is the truth. So therefore, because of that, our purpose is that we want to please Allah. We want to obey his commandments so that we can be successful meaning that we can be saved from going to the fire of hell and we can enter into the gardens of paradise. That's our kind of overarching purpose for every single thing um, that we actually do. Um, so how we balance our worship, our work, our family life, maybe even our own health, um, we do it with this in mind, this overarching purpose in mind. Um, Allah says in the Quran to the nearest meaning, that I did not create jinn and humans except to worship me so this is in essence our main purpose in life is to worship allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, sometimes people think that you know if we practice uh, religion then somehow it's been made to kind of control people it's been made to spoil people's fun so you like, a lot of young people especially they'll think that all right so you're not allowed to do this you're not allowed to do that you're not allowed to do this so therefore, our life will be really boring and bland and there'll be nothing exciting going on. So what I sometimes say to the younger people is actually Islam hasn't come to spoil a person's fun, but it's actually come to ensure that we can live our life in a way that we can enjoy it, we can still have fun, but that we don't go outside of the limits where that fun then becomes a problem. A problem to us, a problem to others, a problem for our hereafter with our relationship with Allah. Um, so I guess like most kind of people probably think that when you think of like a religious person maybe think of someone who's on their prayer mat all day you know praying to Allah you know reading the Quran doing their tasfi uh, their dhikr of Allah um, but then that's all a person kind of puts it down to or it could be like um, Religion is just down to the appearance of a person. So if a man has a, a long beard and loose clothing or a woman wears a hijab and uh, loose clothing, then a person thinks, okay, that must be a religious person. And you get some people that because of that, um, they have maybe a, a negative interaction with someone like that. And as a result, they go, wait a minute, I don't think I like religion anymore because that religious person treated me in a way that was absolutely horrible it made me feel, you know, like nothing. So if that's what religion's all about, then I don't want any part in that religion. Not understanding that actually they've got it the wrong way. That that isn't what religiousness is. It isn't just to pray, and it isn't just based upon our clothing. It goes further than that. Or maybe for some people, again, it's like, okay, they eat halal food. That isn't just the, the entire religion. So that's something that I wanted to kind of clear up um, before we kind of uh, move on inshallah so Islam encompasses every part of our life uh, including our worship our work, our personal life our family life, our health uh, every single aspect of our life is catered for within uh, Islam so you find that within Islam there's a lot of things that you can do the rules are more like some of the parameters that just don't go beyond this limit Whatever you want to do in between that, you can do it. There's plenty to do, but just don't go beyond that. And if you think about it, the commandments of prohibition are very few in comparison to what's allowed. Yeah. So, for example, you can drink most substances, but don't drink alcohol. So it's like it's not saying that you can't drink everything else and you're only allowed to drink water. It's not that restrictive. It's just saying that everything else is not a problem. As in, there may be a couple of other things that are not halal as well that are within liquid form, but everything else is kind of all right. 
the drinks are okay. Just don't drink this drink. And similarly, when you think about it, when it comes to like halal food, there's so much food that we can eat. It's just like, don't eat pork. Yeah. And there are a few other things. So the, the obligations, especially the prohibitions, they're actually not that many. So for example, even when it comes to like a person having a family life, Islam says, no, get married. Yeah. Have a family, have children. Yeah. Um, what's it called? It says, don't just lock yourself away from society. Engage in society. Yeah. So like, you know, in the previous nations before Prophet Muhammad Wasallam, when people wanted to practice their religion, they would go off to like a monastery or maybe they would go off to like live in the forest or in a jungle or somewhere else away from civilization so that they could um, develop their, was it called, uh, connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That was the idea. So they, they were known as like monks, as rahibs. So that was their kind of religiousness. So you, you hear stories about that. But um, for us, as was it called, Muslims, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu he explained to us that we don't practice um, monkhood. That's not part of our religion. Okay, it was part of the previous religions, but it's not part of, uh, was it called, uh, Islam. So that, that's something as well to bear in mind. Um, so when we try to obey the commandments of Allah, what we also attempt to do is to follow in the footsteps of the Prophet Muhammad uh, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam uh, as well. Because the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, uh, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he is an example for us as well uh, to follow. Um, you know, sometimes people think that, well, you know, Islam should have only been about, you know, just... Um, Sorry, I got distracted by that. So that Islam should only be about the kind of uh, having a book. There's a book, there's a Quran, follow it and get on with life. But actually Allah didn't make it like that. Allah sent a person to you know, practically show us this is how you follow Islam. And there are certain reasons for that the scholars explain. Like one of the reasons is so that people don't think that this is not possible to be done. Like what you're asking from us is like, it's not human. So Allah made a prophet to show a physical example. Now this is how you do it. Yeah, you don't have to come up with your own ways. Just, just, just follow the prophet. And the beautiful thing about Islam is that not only do we have the prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam to follow, we actually have his companions as well. So our Islam doesn't just come from just what the prophet peace be upon him taught. It's also how his companions acted. Much of that is where we learn about our Islam uh, as well. And Think about it, not everybody has the characteristics or the qualities of the Prophet Even among the Prophets, they, they differed. So some Prophets, they were very, um, what's the right word? Like you can say that they were very passionate. Like the Prophet Musa, when he would um, was it called, engage with people, it was very kind of straight to the point and quite rough. And, you know, Allah even said to him when he went to Pharaoh that, you know, be kind of like soft in your speech with him. Perhaps he might, you know, he might remember, he might fear Allah. So among the companions of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu you had such a difference of personalities. So you're, you had men, you had women, you had some that were from rich, high up families and some who were from low families, some who had even been enslaved, who were slaves. So you had a whole mixture of people with different personalities. Some of them were soft temperaments, some of them were harder temperaments. But all of them, Allah says in the Quran, that radiallahu anhum wa an. That Allah is pleased with them and they're pleased with him. So these are people that are examples for us too. So we can sometimes relate to a companion, maybe easier than we can relate to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in some ways. Um, and the, the other thing is about that is that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, uh, he's a prophet of Allah, whereas the companions, they're not prophets either. They are more like us than the Prophet Muhammad uh, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So anyway, so within uh, within Islam, then do we what do we find? Like, what are the kind of teachings of Islam? So, like I said, one is that there's no monkhood. So there's no going off to a monastery just to dedicate yourself to the the worship of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. It's about staying among the people. If I remember correctly, there's actually a a, a saying of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi I can't remember it word for word, but the effect of it was that. Um, the person who engages with the people, 
He engages with the community. And as a result, he has to put up with the, I'm putting it in my own words, but the negative uh, effects of engaging with people will actually get more reward than the person who keeps themselves separate from the community. Because it's natural that when you mix with people, you're going to like some people, not like some people. Some people are going to really make you feel good and some people are going to make you feel really rubbish. You can have all sorts of experiences. But yet, the Prophet Muhammad, وسلم, he's telling us what? Engage with people. So part of having a balanced uh, lifestyle when it comes to Islam is we don't have to take ourselves away from everyone. But actually, we can still engage with people. I think about it in Islam. There are so many uh, commandments and teachings of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, about the community, about, for example, our family. So we are told that like, the person who cuts their family relations, then they cut themselves off from the mercy of Allah. That's a, that's a, a strong warning that actually your family, you've got to not only are you naturally connected to your family, but you actually have to make an active effort to continue to keep those bonds. So there's an example of this. is like, you know, when we give charity, we want to get rewarded from Allah, from Allah. So who's more deserving of our charity first? You know, we hear the saying that charity starts at home. And it's true that your family are the first people that you spend upon. They're your priority. And then the relatives that you have and the neighbours that are nearest to you. So Islam's not just saying that, you know, uh, you worry about yourself and you're going to heaven and as a result you can cut off and you don't have to, you know, engage with anybody else. No, you must. You must make an active effort to do this. And it's even being praised that the person who actually just goes to visit a friend, that's a good excuse for a lot of people, isn't it? You'll visit a friend and you can say, not only am I uh, visiting a friend, I'm practising a part of Islam, but it's true. Because, you know, like some people will say that there's sayings in different languages, and one of them is in, in Pashto, the translation of it is that only Allah is okay on their own. Yeah, like only Allah can be on his own and is fine. Everybody else will struggle to be on their own. Um, what's one of the punishments that you'll give to somebody who's in a prison, who's not uh, conforming? The, the, the harshest punishment is segregation. You take them away from people, and they've got no, or they've got very little interaction. That is actually a punishment. Yeah. So can you imagine that in the societies like we know we live in, how lonely people are? You know, you hear stories of people who uh, die in their house and they're found months later, years later. Their own family didn't know that they died because they didn't have a connection with the family. Their own neighbours didn't know that they had died because they never had a connection. The only reason they were found out is because someone thought some, something smelled quite funny or maybe there was some sort of like other reason. And then they realised, oh, wait a minute, such and such a person's died here. So this is against kind of the, the Islamic teachings of how we should be in life. We're actually supposed to engage more with people, not pull ourselves um, away from people. And as a result, we will come up with difficulties but we're rewarded for that as well. Yeah? So going to visit people is a very important part of Islam. Obviously, your family would be more important, but even friends and people keeping connections with one another uh, is actually part of our um, our faith as well. We notice that even when it comes to, like for example, um, the rights of other Muslims that they have upon us, that what's like a right of a Muslim? That if they die, you attend their funeral prayer. Even if you don't know them, I mean, it's probably like, I don't know any other religion where, you know, and I'm sure there may be others, but not that I'm aware of, where someone dies and it's not just the families and the friends and the ones that know them that turn up, but everybody turns up. Whose prayer is it? I don't know. But it's someone's prayer. You know, the people that have just come back from Umrah, you know, they'll notice like, uh, every after every Salah, there's like a janaza. Whose janaza? I don't know whose janaza. So why are you praying it? You don't even know them. You're asking for forgiveness for them. Because they're just, they're a human being. They're a person. Yeah. And suddenly when it comes to like the Prophet Muhammad, peace upon him, when he talked about like, for example, worrying about your neighbor. Yeah, he said to the nearest meaning, if I remember it correctly, that that person is not a, a, a true believer who goes to sleep 
you know, while his go to who goes to sleep full, while his neighbor goes to sleep hungry. Yeah. So, so part of like having a balanced life is and being religious. By the way, this is religious. Is actually engaging with um, other people uh, around about us. So, what about when it comes to, for example, work? So, earning a livelihood. Again, you'll find some people who who think that Islam maybe teaches like you should just rely upon God, rely upon Allah. So, therefore. You don't have to go out and make an active effort um, to earn your livelihood. If it's destined from Allah, then it will come. And if it's not destined, then it won't come. Whereas what did the Prophet Muhammad, وسلم, who's the pinnacle, who's the greatest example of the reliance upon Allah, yeah, tawakkul, what did he do? He worked. So we know that the Prophet Muhammad, وسلم, he had uh, two jobs that we know of that he had. <coughs> When he was a youngster, he was a shepherd. So he used to look after the animals. And some of the scholars, they say that actually all the prophets at some point in their life were shepherds. Right? All of them at some point in their life, they, might, they, they had other occupations at other times, but they always were shepherds. And they say, why? Because Allah was prepping them. Because many of them didn't know they were going to become a prophet until later. Allah was prepping them for the work of being able to be the shepherd of people. So that was the reason that they were, um, they had this occupation given to them. And if you look at like, for example, you go on and watch maybe a documentary of how people um, are shepherds. It's quite, it's quite funny, you know, I mean, it's quite, uh, you know, it tests, it tests your patience. Um you know, can I name drop a, but if you watch, was it called Amazon Prime, you know what I mean? And you get like, probably not the best example, but Clarkson's Farm, you know what I mean? So you've got Jeremy Clarkson, by the way, I'm not really sure if you don't want to listen to swearing and all sorts of jokes, but it's just an example of like what it's like to, was it called, um, be a farmer and running after and the animals are escaping and they're breaking through things and they're causing all sorts of problems and they're injuring you and what, but yet you're so engaged in ensuring that, that, that this flock is taken care of. So actually all the prophets, they say that they, at some point in their life they were they had this. And I don't know if this is true but they mentioned that a story of the Prophet Musa, salam, the Prophet Moses, peace be upon him. The reason I'm mentioning this is actually work teaches us a lot. So it's not a bad thing. It's not an anti-Islamic thing to go out and to work and to earn a livelihood. It's a good thing to do. It's not a bad thing to do. Um so they, they mentioned that Musa he was um, once uh, looking after his flock and while he was doing that, one of the animals escaped and it ran away. And Musa Ram's, like I mentioned, he's quite a, a strong personality, so he was trying to catch it and it kept getting away. Kept getting away, kept getting away. You can imagine the frustration and the anger that's building up now. And eventually when he got a hold of it, where you think, you know, thump that thing, you know what I mean, like one of your kids or something like that, do you know what I mean? Because they've, they've really like tested my patience. At that point, he actually kind of embraced it. And some of the people, they mentioned that, uh, that that was one of the qualities that Allah was prepping him for as a prophet, was that you're going to now deal with people who are going to reject you, who are going to reject Allah's message, and they're really going to give you such a hard time. But rather than letting that turn into hatred and bitterness, actually it should increase your love and compassion for people. And that's how like the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, they mentioned that his heart would make the noise like a boiling kettle. It would be you could hear it. And they said, What was that? It was the worry and concern for people that gave him that sort of constant uh, noise coming from his from his chest. Why? Because he had, his wish was that how can everybody be a person that goes to heaven and not go to the fire of hell, not be harmed, not you know, the Prophet Muhammad is amazing, like when he would be ready to start the prayer, think about it like we're in a big mosque. And you're about to start the prayer. And people have even called sometimes the ikama to start the prayer. And someone would come and say, I need something. You know, like, I'm poor. I need money. He would actually stop right there. And if he had it himself, he would get, give it to him. If he didn't have it, he would borrow it from someone and give it to that person. Or he would ask someone, please, you know, he would do like an appeal. Can you help this person? So Prophet Muhammad is some kind of feeling of um, wishing good for people what was extremely, extremely strong. And that's something that we should have. And I think when we go out to work, like I know like some of you, some of the jobs that you do, 
And there really are jobs that help people. Do you know what I mean? And you think that not only are you earning a livelihood, but you're actually, you know, caring and taking care of others. And that's one of the best jobs that a person can do. So the Prophet Muhammad some he had this job of uh, being a shepherd, but he also had the job of being a trader, yeah, of, of conducting trade. Um, that's actually how he got married to his wife, Khadija radiallahu anha, because Khadija radiallahu anha, she um, was a rich woman of Mecca, and she used to give people the job of trading on her behalf. So you go and carry out my trade, and I'll pay you for that, and whatever extra profit, that used to go to her. And when she uh, got the Prophet Muhammad, peace upon him, employed on this, because he was so truthful, trustworthy, and, and the business went so well, um, that actually made her realize that this person is a really good person. And if I remember correctly, she proposed to him, uh, and then they got married. Um, so the Prophet Muhammad, he got married to Khadija, radiallahu anha. So he was a trader, um, the Prophet Muhammad, when he went to... Obviously, when he became a prophet, then he wasn't able to go about business the way he normally would because he had a lot more responsibilities to carry out. And as a result, he lived a very kind of poor, ascetic lifestyle. Even though he could have made dua and Allah could have made him rich and he could have gone out and worked, but instead, because he had this job, he never... But his companions, you know, he continued to get them to work. When they went to Medina Manawara, where the Muslims had left from Mecca to go to the new city of Medina, one of the first things that was set up was the marketplace in Medina. Imagine you're, you're going to a new area. You think of religiousness, you think, okay, the mosque, I can understand. But the marketplace, why are you setting up the marketplace? Because if people don't have money, then that becomes a serious problem. See, they say that the, the upper hand is better than the lower hand, meaning that the hand that's giving in charity is better than the hand that's receiving charity. And, you know, what do they always say that um, be careful not to, um, to bite the hand that feeds you? And that's generally what happens is that if you are in receipt of um, financial benefits from people, it limits the way you can behave. You're always the lower one. And if you're the one that's giving, then that's always the better thing. That's always the better. So the, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, uh, and has, uh, encouraged his companions uh, to engage in trade as well. So the reason I mention that is that part of religiousness is to actually have a job, especially for the men. Because if you think about it, all the financial responsibilities um, are put upon the men. Maybe a few that are on the women, but the majority, I mean, I'm talking about a couple of scenarios where it might fall on the women, but the majority of situations, the, the financial responsibility um, is upon the men. So therefore, obviously, they have to go out and they have to earn their livelihood. And I remember an example of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Someone came to him and they, they were poor and they didn't. So what did the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam do? If I remember it correctly, he said, well, what have you got? Yeah. And he said, well, um, whatever it was, he had something in the house. I can't remember what it was, like, like, like a dish or something like that. He said, okay, right. He then said, who will, who will, what's it called? Like upon it, who will pay me for it? And the person says, well, I'll give you the money for it. You know, it's like, like for example, you, you've got something valuable in your house and you say, well, I don't know, I've got this mobile phone, it's worth a couple of hundred pounds. If I give it to you, you give me the hundred pounds. When I've got the hundred pounds, you give me the phone back. So anyway, so, so you got some money. So the Prophet Muhammad, وسلم, he got him uh, to buy, if I remember, it was the axe head, you know, the, the head of the axe. And then the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, if I remember correctly, he put the, the stick in it, the handle. And he said to him that go to this place, I think it was just in the outskirts of Medina, and go and chop wood. And chop the wood, bring it into Medina, and sell it. And in that way, earn some money. So after he'd done that, then he earned a little bit of money. He said, okay, now get the money. Go and buy back your dish that you've hung And now you've got money. And he basically set him up in order to be someone that actually earns their income. So earning of an income is actually um, quite an important part of um, Islam. There are some uh, hadith uh, here. So the honest, trustworthy merchant will be with the prophets, the truthful, and the martyrs. So think about it. Like these people are not like just normal people, the prophets. Imagine being with the prophets. Let's talk about on the Day of Judgment. Being with the, the Siddiq, Siddiqin, the, the people who are uh, truthful 
and to be with the martyrs, those who died in the way of Allah. Because if business is done according to the Islamic teachings, the whole of society flourishes. And the opposite happens when business is done in a way that's haram, it causes so much harm to different sections of society. So like, for example, we can see that how much harm is caused in the world as a result of the, the system of riba, of interest, you know, where people get leveraged up against things and then every so often there's a washout. And who is affected? Not the big rich people. Because they just go and say, well, you can't pay for your house anymore. We'll sell it. Because we can always sell it for 75% of the value. So we'll get our loan back. We took the interest from you. Oh, your deposit's gone. We're sorry. Do you know what I mean? So normal people at the bottom are continuously getting um, wiped out and poorer are becoming poorer and richer are becoming richer. So when it's done, so if it's done in the negative, think of all the harm. So therefore, if it's done in the right way, think of all the reward that a person gets uh, for doing it. But at the same time, uh, as a Muslim, we want to ensure that everything is done within a balance. Yeah. So engaging with your community, your family is okay, but there has to be a balance. Going out to work is good, it's encouraged, but there has to be a balance. In every single aspect of our life, there has to be a balance. Otherwise, you know, like they say, too much of a good thing can be bad. Too much of one thing and not taking care of another thing can cause us problems. So what does it mention here? It's a verse of the Quran in Surah Nur. It says, men who are not distracted either by buying or selling from Allah's remembrance or performing prayer or paying alms tax, they fear a day when hearts and eyes will tremble. So that means that just like we, like we're, I'm trying to explain that part of Islam is engaging with the community. Part of Islam is strengthening the bonds of friendship, strengthening the bonds of kinship with your family. Part of Islam is earning a halal good income, being of benefit for people. Um, these are all good things to do, a benefit of society. But at the same time, if a person just engages in those things, but neglects prayer, neglects to remember Allah, yeah, neglects, was it called, um, the paying of the zakat, then now that thing is actually distracting him from his purpose in life. Because we go about these other things with the overarching purpose in mind. So we always got to make sure that, and, and it's something that the pious people, they'll generally do every night, that they might sit down and look and think, let me do some self-rectification, mm -hmm. self, um, what's it called? You know, when you kind of look into yourself, was it? Re in, yeah, self-reflection or introspection or whatever it's called. They'll sit there and they'll go, wait a minute, how did my day go today? Yeah. What did I do? So did I do everything that I was supposed to do? Was there anything that I did that was wrong? If there was, they ask Allah for forgiveness. They make an intention not to repeat it again. And then the next day they try and make that better than the day before. That's kind of how they go about um, doing things. So that's something that uh, we have to look at as well, that have we got everything in balance or, or, or not? Um, it also mentions here that I think we mentioned this in, when we were talking about how uh, when a person gets married and the man he spends on his family, then as a result of doing that, that's one of the best places that he can spend his money. So we mentioned that. And I also mentioned that when it's also counted as an act of charity, and when you give charity, Allah makes you richer. Yeah. So there are so many benefits of, of engaging us. And again, when you engage in the community with family and friends, it will cost you money. It does cost you money. Yeah, you try and keep all your relations with all your relatives. Someone's going to need a bit of help here and there. Yeah, so it's going to cost you a bit of money. You know, you're engaging even with your friends. You know, sometimes you have to buy the coffee. Sometimes the other person has to buy. You know, there's a bit of extra expenditure. But if you realize that that counts as sadaqah, that counts as charity, and Allah will make you richer, then it gives you the encouragement that it's okay to spend. Actually, rather than losing... Allah is going to give me back um, even more. And what I mean, I forgot to mention at the beginning was that this is why, you know, like when you give in charity, it, it's reward. You get a lot of reward. If you give to your family, you get double the reward. Why? Because one, you've given in charity, but two, you've strengthened the bonds of kinship. Remember I mentioned earlier that strengthening the bonds of kinship is important. So if you go out and give, like, say, for example, 
you get a charity and you just put it in the box and it goes off to someone, that's good, you'll get rewarded for it. But if you go, well, do you know what? My cousin actually is struggling a bit. You know, maybe they're on a low income. You know, they're struggling with the kids. Do you know what? I need to buy something for the kids. I'll give them a week. That's you spending in charity. You don't need to say it is charity. You know, here I go. This is charity. You poor beggar. Do you know what I mean? That's not what you do. But the fact that you just spend as a gift, um, you know, that's it. You get the reward for it. You know, so there are ways and means that you could do it without um, embarrassing uh, the person. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu he explained that if you give gifts, this creates love. So if you gift someone something, many times that's a way of removing the ill will that's within people's hearts. Sometimes with relatives, there may be some ill will you don't know. Some guy is fuming and angry for years and you didn't even know it. Do you know what I mean? And they're building it up inside them because maybe, I don't know, one day you, you didn't phone them when something bad happened. But when you just go and give a gift or even say assalamu alaikum to people, then all of a sudden you see that that, that disappears again. And then it gets back to normal. So giving gifts is also an important part. And you get the reward, inshallah, as if you're giving in charity. Okay. Um, so like I mentioned about family as well, that family is important. Yeah, We try to balance everything here, by the way. I'm probably making it a bit all over the place, but hopefully it will make sense anyway. So family is a very important part of Islam. Yeah, I mean, if you talk to people that are not Muslim, one of the things that I, I've heard mentioned to me many times is we really, really are amazed by how your family system is kept strong. Even in this country, they say, like, you just care about your elderly, do you know what I mean? And you all live together, and yous, they don't know that we all fight together as well, do you know what I mean? They don't know about that, but, like I said, that's part of being in a family, that you have the clash, you know, as they say, the clash of, like, plates and stuff like that, that happens, but, as they say, as long as no plates get broken, and it, it, you're going to naturally have these uh, things. And you know what it is, see, when you engage with people, it makes you humble, or it should do. Yeah, you know, because, like, you might think, oh, I'm, like, this big shot guy, and then you talk to a family member, and they just, like, shoot you down, and you just think, for God's sake, man, I feel pure horrible now. And you go, do you know what? It's not good what they did, but in some ways, do you know what? It kind of brings you back down, you know? And there's some scholars, they mentioned that, you know, whenever, like, I have a negative experience with people, you know, I don't mind because I think there's so many people that think I'm better than I actually am and they praise me and they treat me nicely. And if every so often someone kind of like gives me a really negative one, I kind of go, well, actually, I've still got kind of more of the positive than I have um, of the negative. So actually, it's a very good experience. That's what, you know, like, if you look at like where we live now, society's kind of changed. People have become more um, individualistic. They only worry about themselves. And they're the most important thing in life. You know, they say, oh, if it makes me happy, if I feel like it, and you go, and then you go to Islam, and, and Islam's like, actually, you don't feel like it, but you still got to do it. You know, you don't feel like it, but you still have to do it. It's like the opposite. It's you're not the center of the world. Yeah. There's more things important than you. So therefore, you've got to kind of engage with everything. It's a beautiful way of, of life. I remember when the Qatar World Cup was going on, and there was all that big hoo-ha about, you know, Qatar, and they've got these rules regarding family and these rules regarding relationships and whatever, and boycott them and X, Y, all this stuff, right? So they, they interviewed one of the guys, and he said, actually, do you know what it is? He goes, it's a different culture. You don't really understand us. That in your culture, the individual is the most important. In our culture, society is more important. So therefore, the individual will have to sacrifice for society, whereas in your culture, the individual will sacrifice society for themselves. That's the difference. And in Islam, that's very much it, that you're the one that is making these sacrifices. Yeah, You think about it if you, you know, like let's say a lot of people, they say, no, I don't want to get married. I don't want to have uh, kids. I don't want to do all this. Why? Because then I'll not be able to go on holidays and I'll not be able to enjoy myself and I'll get old quickly and, you know, it, all this. That's what everyone's worried about, isn't it? You know, I mean, maybe not so much the men, but the women are more worried about, like, what their looks will be like and all that. And you know, with the, But what's the reality that, um, yes, it's difficult. It is difficult. But in the long run, it's beneficial. Do you know what I mean? And for the rest of society, it, it's beneficial. 
So sometimes to be a benefit to society, you actually have to kind of go in and, you know, that's where it kind of creates some uh, issues. You know what I mean? You feel a bit like you're getting kind of disrespected and this and that. But but that's where um, you get the benefits. And similarly, when you're going out and you're working and, you know, you've got to deal with, you know, people that are shouting at you and get angry with you and frustrated with you. But the other thing is it also teaches you good qualities. Um, do you know what I mean? You find that families that have, like, lots of kids, those kids are all rough and tumble and they've been beaten and they've been slagged and all that's been done to them, you know what I mean? So they kind of grow up, they're kind of a bit more, like, rough and ready and can get on with the world. And you find sometimes if there's, like, one kid on their own and they grow up and they're protected in this bubble and they're the special one, then what happens is when they leave the house and they go into society, they just expect the whole of society to treat them like that. And when they don't get it, then they actually have, like, a kind of crisis, you know? So, so these are kind of things, benefits of us uh, following the different aspects of Islam. So when we engage it with our family, what are the, we've got responsibilities. So for example, as a father, the Prophet ﷺ, he mentioned to the readers, meaning that um, the greatest... I'm oh, sorry, I've not got... I must have got it down somewhere else. What he said was that the best thing that a, a father can gift his child, his son with, is good manners. Yeah. So like the responsibilities that are put on us is that not only do you have children, have a family, but also it's your responsibility now to to teach. It's your responsibility to inculcate good habits. And sometimes people think that that's just by saying something. But actually kids are smarter than that. They don't they listen to you a bit, but they also look at your actions and go, oh, wait a minute, is this guy actually what he's telling me is he actually doing it, and it happens with the mums as well. You know, the mum will say, "Oh, I want my you know, my son to or daughter or whatever to read Quran and do this and do that." You know, okay, do you do it yourself? No, no, no. But I'm but you like, well, you need to lead by uh, example if you want to. Was it called uh, uh, be heard? So, so engaging with your family is important. Spending time with them is important as well. Um, it's not just about material things; it's also about quality time. Because that's how you build relationships up. And if you don't build relationships up, then it's very difficult for you to influence someone as well. So if you want to influence your kids in a good way, but you don't have a relationship with them, then it becomes very difficult. And you hear that from like celebrities, you know, the children when they grow up and they start giving interviews. And they say that, yeah, my mom and dad, they bought us everything. You know, holidays, you know, cars, everything. But they never gave us much of their time. Do you know what I mean? And that's something that they miss. So as well as taking care of the financial responsibilities, there's also about spending time with uh, the family as well. Uh, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu is amazing. Like, think about it. Like, you're like the head of state. You're the prophet of a religion, the final prophet of Allah. But yet, in other things, he could like engage right down with the basic person on the street. So if there was a kid, for example, he could interact in such a way that all the kids used to feel happy. Do you know what I mean? And then if you had to go and deal with like a king of a country, he could manage that. If you had to go and deal with like a priest or a rabbi, he could manage it. You know, he was so kind of versatile in, in everyone that he could engage with. So when it would be like children in that, he would engage with them in such a way that even after he passed away, they would remember. So like Anas radiallahu anhu, he used to, when the Prophet peace upon him went to Medina, Manawara, then his, I think it was his mother said that you go and your job is to serve the Prophet peace upon him. That's your job. Now imagine like you're a young kid, I think he was about 10 or something. So he goes like, sometimes I used to do it and then other times I'd forget and I'd go and start playing in the way and, you know, the Prophet Muhammad would come and then, you know, I'd say, have you done that yet? Oh, no, no, not yet. I was on my way to do it. And he said, you know, in all the time that I served the Prophet, peace be upon him, he said, never once did he kind of scold me. Never once did he say to me, why didn't you do that? Even if the people in the family would like pull the kid up, the Prophet, peace upon him, would say something like, look, if it was destined to be done, it would have been done. So that's the way that the Prophet Muhammad was engaged. Even with like young kids, there was a boy, I think his name was Omer, if I remember correctly. And he had a small bird. And I can't remember the name of the bird, but it, it rhymed with his name. So it, it, the Prophet used to go to his house and used to see him playing with this little small bird. And then the bird died. So the Prophet would even, even went to console the boy that, oh, what happened to your pet? You know, what happened to this bird? So the reason I mention this is that this is also part of Islam. The, 
to kiss your children is part of Islam as well. The Prophet, peace upon him, he kissed like Hassan and Hussein, his grandchildren. And someone was shocked that I don't do this. We never do that. Uh, do you know what I mean? Like, as in it's like, it's not something that we do. You know, we're very kind of strong, tough people and we don't do that. And I think the Prophet, peace upon him, he said to me, it's meaning that, you know, what can I do if there's no mercy in your heart? If mercy has been taken out of your heart, what can I do for you? So even these type of interactions, the, the, the daughter of the Prophet وسلم, when she would come in, Fatima radiallahu anha, the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, he would get up to greet her, you know, give her a kiss and say, sit down here next to me. You know, um, and again, he would say nice kind of words about Fatima radiallahu anha, you know, that like Fatima, she's like a part of me. So these are type of ways that we should also be kind of engaging with our kids and our family. Um, but saying that, again, it's about having a balance, not to the extent that we then neglect our prayer and other aspects of our religion. So it's mentioned that when the Prophet وسلم, he would be engaging with his family, they were having a joke and laugh and whatever. And then the Adhan would go. He said it was as if he never knew us. He couldn't recognize us. Like his face would like go away and he would get really worried. Why? Because now that a summon has been made to the commandments of Allah, he would go, he would do his wudu and he would head for salah. So that's kind of the way that we engage is that, yes, we engage and do every single thing that we're supposed to do. But when it comes to, for example, the five daily prayers, wait, I need to go now. When it comes to, like, so for, whether you're at work, whether you're with your family, whether you're resting at night, it's the time for prayer. Okay, right now I need to stop, I need to go. Now, sometimes people might think that, I'm going to try and wrap it up now in a few minutes. Sometimes people might think that, well, um, in order to be a really good Muslim, I need to be extreme. Yeah, extreme in, in some instances, like to get more reward and to show that I'm more, you know, loyal to Allah. And that this happens at the time of the Prophet Muhammad. Some, there were some young men. It usually happens in young men. It can happen in everyone, but generally young men are kind of all full of like, you know, this uh, enthusiasm and then they maybe like not thought it through yet. So what happened was that these three men, it became known that they had made vows. So one had vowed um, that he would fast every single day of his life. Every single day of his life he would fast. Obviously we're supposed to fast in the month of Ramadan. There's dates that you should fast, but he was like, no, every single day I'll fast. Another person said that he would spend every night in the worship of Allah. Yeah, every the whole night, not part of the night, the whole night, night shift, the whole of your life. That's what he would do. And another person said that I'll never marry, I'll be celibate. Yeah. And they thought that this was religiousness. So when the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu he came to know of it, because it started to become known in the community, wow, look at these people, what they're doing. The Prophet Peace of said that, bring them to me. Yeah, I'm paraphrasing this. And when he came and he said that, um, he inquired if that was what they had done. And he said, are you more fearing of Allah or am I more fearing? And obviously the Prophet Allah, you're more, more fearing of Allah than I. And the Prophet Muhammad Peace Muhammad says that I fast and then the times where I eat, when I'm not fasting, yeah, I get up to pray at night, meaning the extra prayer, but I also sleep at night. And he says, and I also marry as well. So you have to follow me. Yeah, you don't just make it up as you go along. You've got to follow the example. So everything has to be done so you don't go to any extreme. But at the same time, it shouldn't be to the extent that you also start to neglect the commandments of Allah because it mentions here in the Quran that do not let family distract you. Your wealth and your children are only a temptation, whereas Allah with him is an immense reward. So to kind of finish it up, what it is is we can kind of try and uh, make an effort to um, balance, it, balance everything out uh, in our life to ensure that not no one aspect of our, what's it called, uh, life is uh, missed out. And in, in doing that, we will actually be following Islam. So may Allah make it easy for all of us, inshallah. Let's see.